also bring that set that aspect of things. So let me hand over the floor to Mr. Joseph Nath O'Reilly, who is the executive director of the International Parliamentary Network of, for Education and who is our moderator of the next session. And this session, I must remind you, is about breaking new ground as this, co this coalition evolves. So it's over to you. Thank you very much. And above all, thank you to all of you who have stuck with us this morning. I know it's been a, a long morning. There's been a lot of interesting content, which I'm sure has kept you with us. Um, but we deprived you of your mid-morning snack, which we ought not to do, right? So we appreciate that so much. Um, and I promise that we will fly through this and that we've got a lovely lunch for you uh, to reward you for your efforts. So thank you. I, I wanted to start today, though, um, acknowledging something. And, and that is that I've spoken to a lot of you over the last couple of days and we all came, if, it's, if I'm honest, to this meeting with heavy hearts, didn't we? There's a lot going on in the world. Everywhere we turn, uh, there are terrible things happening. From the terrible conflict in Israel and Palestine to the fact that we are approaching the second anniversary of the war in Ukraine, uh, to the observation that President Castro made yesterday that we seem to be able to find money to wage wars, but not to support human development. And what's more, of course, at the back of all of that is the, the existential challenge posed by climate change. I mean, even as I re reel through them, I have to take a breath, because there's a lot happening that it's hard to find hope in. But what I wanted to do is draw the link between that and acknowledge it, because sometimes we have to acknowledge uh, the challenges that we face and how difficult things are, but also capture the hope that we have borne over the last couple of days. And what strikes me so, uh, so much is that what we're talking about is a solution, at least in part, to so many of those challenges. And not just that, because sometimes we know what the solutions are, but we don't see much progress. On this issue, we're making progress. Carmen started yesterday by reminding us that all those children whose schools were stopped during COVID didn't receive a school meal. But since then, more children are now receiving school meals than prior to COVID. There aren't too many... Uh, social services that have been able to rack up or to, to that level of achievement. There are not too many things uh, in the world which have got better than they were before COVID because we're still struggling. Uh, and that's something to celebrate. And what's more, buoyed by that, we've seen new commitments, new partners join the coalition to accelerate that very progress. So it is a difficult world sometimes, but there is hope, and some of that hope is in the movement to give every child, every day, a nutritious meal at school. What could be better? What could be a better movement to be part of? Because it's both positive, it's happening, and it's transformative. And I commend you for being here, for staying with us all morning, but most importantly, for being part of this effort. And I wanna commend all of the panelists for what they're about to tell you, which is we're crowding in even more support. Today's uh, session, this session, is about new things that you haven't already heard about, but evidence of more action in support of school meals, and that's very, very exciting. And I wanna start with uh, our colleagues from civil society. We've heard from government, we've heard from other partners, but we also know that school meals are delivered by and advocated for civil society. Uh, people out in the community want school meals and they're part of delivering them. So I'm really excited to, to welcome uh, our colleagues from Plan International and World Vision today, uh, Andrew and uh, uh, Kathleen, and they're going to tell us a little bit about what they as organisations are doing in respect of school meals and also talk about a little initiative which they've been part of, which is bringing civil society together 
under the banner of the School Meals Coalition to do more work on this very issue. So Andrew, I want to start with you uh, and just ask you to tell us a little bit about what World Vision's doing around the world in support of School Meals. Thank you, and it's a real privilege to be with you um, this morning. Um, one of the reasons I've traveled here, and you can imagine that we're quite busy at the moment. Uh, one of the reasons um, I've traveled here and Kathleen's traveled here amongst all the turmoil is because we're, we're committed and we're passionate about school meals. And so this is something we believe, as you say, we, do, we genuinely believe can change the world. To put it into perspective, World Vision delivers a million school meals a year. So um, that's lots, uh, that's you know, a very significant programming. And for us, we work across many different programs. This is one of our key signature programs. And I just want to talk to you about some of the specific countries that we're working with and some of the changes that we've made there. So um, first of all, in Burundi, um, anyone here from Burundi? Nice to meet you. It's great to see you. Well, great partners of ours. We, we work with smallholder farmers in Burundi. And what's interesting about school meals is for us, it's not just the meal, it's the local community development that we do at the same time. And we work with 150 schools and um, 150,000 students. And we're helping them to understand what a nutritious meal looks like. In Mozambique, we're working with, um, we've been working for 13 years, and there we deliver to nearly 100,000 um, children. Anyone from Mozambique? Yeah, hello, nice to see you, Mozambique. It's great to see you. And, um, and in Rwanda, we, we've had a long association in Rwanda. We've just, uh, we've delivered uh, water to a million people in Rwanda in the last couple of years, and part of that is delivering water to schools as part of our school meals program. Um, assistance and uh, the government in Rwanda are now rolling out the program themselves after we've been working with them. But my final point, I just want to talk to you about a school in DRC. Uh, I visited this school uh, last year, it's in North Kivu um, uh, um, precinct and it, I met a child called Andrew and my name is Andrew so he made me smile and we, we, ha we had a, a joke about being um, having the same name. And um, he told me that just two years ago, he couldn't go to school because he was unable to work because he was lethargic and he, was, he just couldn't focus. So his family wanted him to work in the field instead. And because of the school meal program that we put in place together with PLAN and together with World Food Program, he's changed and he's now learning. So we do transform people's lives. Thank Brilliant. you. Amazing to hear, and thank you for being part of that effort. So Kathleen, Plan International, uh, tell us about what you're doing in respect of school meals. Oh, Good work. It's on. Um, and also just love to share the stage with Andrew and World Vision. We're doing so much work together. Um, for those who don't know, Plan, we're a dual mandate organization focused both on the development space and the humanitarian space. We focus on girls in crisis um, and girls' rights in about 80 plus countries. Um, Plan is a you know, partner with governments around the world related to food um, feeding programs. And I particularly want to use um, our time to talk a little bit about school gardens. Um, we feel that this is one of the best examples um, to combat child hunger, uh, but to ensure that children lead, uh, learn, decide, and thrive. So I wanted to show a couple examples. I saw uh, we have Sierra Leone in the room today. Let's see, yes, in the front row. Thank you, thank you. Um, plan, and one of our um, um, uh, first projects is with the Ministry of Basic and Senior Secondary Education in Sierra Leone. We have been in the past year uh, working on a, a joint program serving 300,000 meals a day uh, to children. Um, and in this uh, year, we've been looking at homegrown um, models that really extend the production process and into the schools itself. And one of the really amazing parts about school gardens is the ability to be able to partner with uh, women-owned businesses as we look at purchasing commodities that accompany uh, the, the school feeding programs. Um, and also partnering with the caretakers. Um, part of the programming work that we have and the caretakers of school gardens is to provide technical assistance and capacity building, um, to provide garden prep um, and seed testing. 
and we're really looking forward to expanding this work um, in 30 other communities, um, including water harvesting um, and parent involvement at well. So that's one example. Um, a second is our work in Cambodia. Do we have anyone from, we have a few folks. Oh yes, in the second row, here we go. Um, our school gardens joint project is really an extension of the classroom. In this case, it's a wonderful example around bringing um, real world context to STEM subjects. So really providing training uh, to children and young people around the latest agriculture techniques, including hydroponics, and really making that really great connection between school um, meals um, and learning. And then just my last point is around school gardens in rural and conflict affected settings. You know, school gardens is a, not only a local option, um, provides consistent food supply, but it provides a resilience um, to disruption during conflict. And really it's also another incentive for obviously schools to stay open and children to be able to remain um, in those conflict settings. So those are just a few examples for, from PLAN. Great to hear both of those examples from, from each of you. So in addition to what you're doing on the ground in supporting the delivery of school meals, uh, both of the, your organizations have been involved in uh, issuing a call to action this week, a civil society call to action, which over 100 other civil society organizations have supported, which is amazing. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yep, happy to. So the idea is that we try to bring civil society together to, to help them to facilitate school meals, but also to hold governments to account. And we can help by building local advocacy and building regional advocacy to ensure that the, the meals are being delivered well. And we can do that when we come together as civil society. And we, we're trying to lay down um, logos and egos and work together uh, for the child. Perfect. Kathleen, do you want to say anything further before we move on? No, absolutely. I mean, one, we're really excited about World Vision and Plan's commitment to lead the call to action and to help galvanize um, CSOs together. Um, while there's 100 CSOs that have signed on, there's a few of you that haven't signed on yet in the room with your green badges. I think we have our dear colleague, Amanda, in the back. Amanda, can you raise your hand? Um, Amanda's helping to coordinate. So if you're interested in joining um, the call to action, there is still time. Um, we brainstormed yesterday. We brought brought together a lot of the CSOs yesterday to think about how can we be supportive of governments? Um, how can we help? And so some of the ideas we thought about and we'll be brainstorming together is around seed funding. How can we select a few countries to be able to help um, uh, provide um, advocacy and technical assistance, capacity building and partnerships? We talked about how do we bring accountability mechanisms, both at the grassroots level and into these global spaces? Um, and how can we as 100 plus CSOs come together to help provide to governments policy and advocacy, advocacy toolkits, um, case studies, media attention, and really lift up those governments that are really delivering um, on commitments. Um, and just uh, two other just quick points on the call Very to action. Quick. Oh is the call to action also brings, I think, a focus on ensuring that we are reaching those that need it most. And I'll just end with this one point. We heard this yesterday, that for the children that need access to school feeding programs in lower income countries, we're only reaching 18% and at a global level, 40%, and at a higher income level, 60%. So the call to action is really to help bring that 18% up. So I'll end with that. Right, well, we absolutely love that because what we want to focus on is the furthest behind and make sure that no child is left behind. So we need the most progress in those areas where we're seeing the, the, the least progress. Great. So that's a great segue to our next two speakers because civil society's call to action is about coalescing and coordinating and growing the demand from communities. And some of that demand, of course, will be directed to parliaments and parliamentarians who represent those, par those, those constituencies in the national parliaments. And I'm delighted that we have today with us two members of parliament, um, both members of the International Parliamentary Network for Education, which is working on this issue, uh, Nima Lugangira from Tanzania and Peter Nortsukoto from uh, Ghana. And Nima, I'm going to start with you first. Um, very simply, why are you an advocate for school meals? Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, special thanks to the School Meals Coalition and WFP for giving us the opportunity to be here because oftentimes in these discussions, members of parliament are left out. 
So it's very happy to, to note that School Mills Coalition and the WFP recognize the importance of parliamentarians, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, I must also commend our President's Her Excellency, President Dr. Samia Suluhassan, who is a true champion of nutrition in Tanzania. And that, that's one of the reasons that I am also a huge champion of, um, of nutrition. But alongside that, before being a parliamentarian, I was working in the agricultural sector ad advocating for policy change. And one of the things I came to realize is that the agricultural sector focuses on food security and excludes nutrition security. So there's a lot of focus on production for selling and not production for consumption, which is why you find in many African countries, food basket regions have a high level of malnutrition. And that is no different even in Tanzania. And then that took my interest further, like why is that the case? And I came to find out shockingly, the region that I come from, Kagera, is the region that hosts the highest number of actual stunted children. Although we have very arable land, we have two rainfall season, so it doesn't make sense. Why should we be in that situation? So that led me to my interest and commitment um, to champion issues of, of nutrition. And I got a further understanding that although oftentimes when um, there are bad results in schools, blame is put on teachers, and most governments tends to focus on infrastructure investments, desks, classrooms, et cetera. But there is a huge link between nutrition and human capital development. And to me, coming from a developing country, I understand the importance of us investing in human capital development. And our human capital is our people. And if our people are not raised in such a way that they can you know, blossom, which needs nutrition, so those are just some of the few reasons why I champion nutrition. That's a very compelling answer to the question. And it really sets out some of the case for school feeding, right? And for school meals, which I think is so powerful. I also want to pay tribute to Nima because Tanzania uh, as a country has joined the School Meals Coalition. It doesn't have a national school meals program, but I understand that's its aspiration. But certainly um, we talked about this. Nima went back, did some advocacy to the president, and that was instrumental in getting Tanzania to, uh, to join the coalition, which I think is proof purchase of what parliamentarians can do. So today we've heard a lot, and yesterday we've heard a lot from governments. The last session was hearing from local government. Um, we've heard from ministries and civil society, but an important part of this picture in accelerating progress around school meals is in fact parliaments. So apart from advocating to your government to join the School Meals Coalition, tell us a little bit more about what parliamentarians can do and what you've been doing. Um, when we talk about parliamentarians, we have one of the most crucial roles that is being discussed here today, the finance part. You know, we're the ones who pass government budgets and have oversight of government's budgets. So when I got sworn into parliament, it was November 2020, um, nutrition wasn't much of an agenda being discussed on the floor. But I can tell you today, we have more than 50 MPs who are always constantly talking about nutrition. Because I was, any chance that I got to speak, even if it was to do with defense, I would find a way to put in nutrition. Um, because it's, if people are hungry, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a security issue, right? Um, so we have that role. And therefore, it's important, though, for us to be capacitated to understand how to link nutrition and the importance and the impact nutrition has on all other governments, um, government budgets. That is why an organization like IPNED um, is very crucial, the International Parliamentary Network on Education, because it provides us as parliamentarians the technicalities of knowing how to advocate, but also how to mobilize and build case uh, for nutrition. So very quickly, an initiative that I've been doing since being a member of parliament is number one, the Minister of Agriculture has set up a national school meals guideline, kind of as a base to show how the government will go about the issue of school meals. But secondly, as Joseph mentioned, Tanzania joined the school meals uh, coalition last year. And thirdly, right now, um, something that I'm working on with our local government in Bukoba is to do a pilot of school meals through an NGO that I founded. We're currently working with 44 schools. And the approach that we're taking is a more sustainability one, whereby having school gardens and school farming and recognizing that some parents are not able to contribute financially. For example, the region that I come from, the GDP, the average um, income per person is 1.5 US dollars a day. 
So you cannot expect these parents, they will be able to contribute to school meal um, program for their child. So we also have to recognize those differences in, in um, local government. So we've come up with this, with an initiative of trying to find a more sustainable approach by doing school gardens, school farming, and seeing how parents and communities can, can also contribute um, to that program. So, and through my efforts as a member of parliament, we've been able to mobilize the support and buy-in from the community, the local government leaders, the teachers, the parents, and most importantly, the political leaders. Now to, to sign off, one of my biggest and most proudest achievement is, although I come from the ruling party, um, CCM, uh, in our election in 2020, I was able to advocate, mobilize, and convince three political parties, including two of our opposition parties, to prioritize nutrition in their election manifestos. Because let me tell you one thing, all technocrats can do and say what they want, but with politicians, if it's not in our election manifesto, we're not going to prioritize it. Thank you. Brilliant. I definitely think that deserves a clap. And it's an important principle which uh, Nima uh, illuminated there, and that is the work that we do, but also that civil society supports, is always cross-party, right? Um, uh, ministers who are here will come from particular parties. As, as Nima says, she comes from the government party in Tanzania. But what we're trying to do is identify those areas where we can create common cause, an education for children, the love of children that we were talking about earlier, and ensuring that children have a healthy meal at school every day surely is one of those issues, and that's what we're committed to, generating a political consensus that this is something that everyone should support. So let's fly across the African continent from East Africa to West Africa and bring in uh, Peter Notsukoto from uh, Ghana. Um, Peter is the, 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 the ranking member in the parliament on education. Um, we would sometimes say the, the shadow minister for education. And in contrast to Tanzania, Ghana does have uh, a, a national school meals program. Um, when I was there though, uh, we talked openly with both government and uh, the implementer uh, and the World Food Program and civil society about some of the challenges it faces. And I know, Peter, that you're aware of some of those challenges. And that what we've talked about and many people suggested was that one of the ways to address those challenges uh, is through legislation a function which only Parliament has, which is unique to Parliament, and that is providing the program with a basis in law. So, Peter, can you say a little bit more about that? Thank you very much, and good morning to everybody. As um, he said, well, I belong to the opposition in Parliament, and um, it is our duty to put government on its toes. Uh, unfortunately, Ghana is yet to sign on to the coalition. Um, I've seen a lot, I've heard a lot happening here for these two days, and it is my hope that uh, when I get back, my Minister for Education will listen to me so that Ghana can sign uh, on to the coalition. Yeah, school feeding is an important um, event in the life of every country and every child. I remember when I was a child, I had to walk four kilometers a day to school. You will leave very early in the morning, uh, parents were asked to contribute food uh, stuffs like uh, 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 cocoa yam, plantain. Then in the afternoon, the school authorities will cook for you. Then you have a joint meal. That's what we were doing. So in 2007, Ghana started the school feeding program, uh, at least to make sure that uh, pupils in the primary school uh, had at least one hot meal a day. Um, the program was supported by Danish International Development Agency for four years, but for now, Ghana is fully funding the program. Uh, we have about 3.8 million children who are on the program out of the 4.5 million uh, primary school children. Uh, Ghana has uh, two levels of a school feeding program, one at the primary level and the other at the secondary level. But my concern has been that of uh, the primary level. Uh, as you really said, um, we have uh, some challenges in the implementation of uh, the program. And um, currently, I'm a member of the committee that is investigating uh, the challenges and see what we can do uh, so that uh, we bring back the school feeding program online because um, we have discovered that it is not being managed well. Uh, 
So uh, one of our recommendations so far is that uh, we should make sure there's a legal framework to make sure that uh, it is an agency and it is well fenced so that the budgetary allocations are not diverted. Uh, money is meant for the school feeding program go directly to the school uh, feeding program agency instead of going through the Ministry of uh, Gender and Social uh, um, Protection, which is in charge of that uh, agency. So legislation is one of our priorities. And um, though government may not be interested in passing the legislation, as minority members, we are trying what we call a private member's bill, so that uh, if it is uh, passed by parliament, it will be binding on government to make sure that uh, that law takes effect, so that uh, we can protect the program and make it more um, friendly, we can make it more accessible, so that every child in Ghana, by our declaration, that by 2030, every primary school child in the country that is Ghana should benefit from the school feeding program. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And I think that, you know, this, I think, reflects the common cause that can be built between civil society and parliamentarians to improve school meals programs where they already exist, create them where they don't, including giving them a legislative basis, ensuring the financing is happening, uh, and as both colleagues said, ensuring that governments are delivering against their legislation and their policy. This is absolutely crucial uh, and, an, and a very important part of this work. Nima, on the legislative front, I just want to bring you back in again. Um, what's your sense of the importance of that in the context that you're working? Um, very quickly, what I can say, um, our president, Her Excellency President Dr. Samir Sulu Hassan, when she was a vice president, she introduced uh, budgetary requirements on nutrition. Um, and it was said as um, every local government should budget about 1,000 shillings uh, per child from their own um, source, income source. So that's the legislation, it's there and it's happening. But one thing that I can say, which I'm trying to push right now, is even if it's in the law and the budget is set, the budget needs to be ring-fenced legally. It has to be ring-fenced. Because when the budget is not ring-fenced, what happens is whenever there's a little crisis or there is a need of funding, the, f the first funding that will be touched is the nutrition one. So what I can you know, advocate and reaffirm is that, and tell my brother from Ghana, the idea and all other um, CSOs and everybody, nutrition budget has to be ring-fenced. Thank you. So uh, those of you at the back of the room or who are watching online uh, won't have seen the nods uh, and uh, yeses from ministers sitting at the front of the room. <laughs> I'm not going to name them because they might get into trouble. But my good friend, the minister from South Sudan, you know, she talks about the importance of parliamentary demand for education. We've talked about this many times. She's such a powerful advocate on this issue. And the minister from Sierra Leone was nodding vigorously in respect of Nima's points about saying that the, even, that the legislation and the funding needed to be ring-fenced. Sounds like that's something she'd like her parliament to do there, right? So this is the point, right? These are about coalitions that we're pulling together, parliamentarians with an interest, cross-party, to help the ministers and the governments deliver on their priorities uh, with the support, crucially, of civil society uh, who should be out there demanding these things, bringing the voice to parliament uh, so that they know. Just to say, sometimes I think in this world, one of the things that we find as a parliamentary network is that people don't really understand the work very well, don't understand how to work with parliamentarians. So let me just say quickly, parliamentarians are advocates. They speak up for these issues. And we know that the more these issues, education, nutrition, child development, are talked about in parliament, the more they will be regarded as a priority. Too often we talk about the wars we're waging and not the development of our citizens. So that's the first thing. In addition to advocacy, parliamentarians have this unique role of creating a legal basis for work. So legislation is something. They also, all parliaments, have a role in financing, either in approving the appropriations or in monitoring them. And so that's crucial. And then finally, parliament monitors what government does. 
So those are all crucial functions, and our job uh, as a network is to support these parliamentarians to perform those functions better, with more information, with more support, and with the tools to do so. And one of the things I just want to announce today that IPNED is uh, doing is it is publishing a toolkit for parliamentarians on school feeding. It will set out the case for school feeding, which we've heard so much about in the last couple of days, uh, but also taking each of those functions, share with parliamentarians what they can do to be better advocates, what legislation can look like, how to support better financing for school meals, and finally, how to help uh, hold governments to account for their school meals policies and programs. So that's what will be there. It'll be a global public good that parliamentarians can use, and we're also hoping that civil society will find it useful in their work with parliaments around the world on this issue as well. So we thank our two parliamentary members today for being part of this panel. Fantastic. So we also have uh, at the end of uh, the respective ends of our panel today our two colleagues uh, who are going to um, share some uh, announcements with us and I want to bring in uh, Heidi Kessler first. Heidi is the Deputy Director of the Global Trialed Nutrition Foundation and they've got some plans for next year which Heidi is going to tell us about. Use your microphone. Thank you. We're, we're good at sharing. We'll share wows. Appreciate it. Thank you. As a little bit of background, uh, Global Child Nutrition Foundation is a small NGO based in the United States working globally. For the past 20 years, our sole focus year in and year out has been supporting governments and their partners, ensuring that they have the knowledge, tools, and connections that they need to expand high quality school meal programs. One of the ways that we do this is through the Global Child Nutrition Forum, a multi-day conference held in a, different com in a different country each time, bringing together governments and their partners for a peer-to-peer -peer exchange on the pressing issues relevant to school meal programs today. I'm pleased to announce that the next forum is offered in support of the School Meal Coalition members and is an official part of the School Meals Coalition calendar and is projected to be held in late 2024. It will be the 24th edition of the event. The four-day program will provide an in-depth look at the host country's program as we visit local schools to see the program in action and, and gain ideas and examples that we can bring home and, and think about applying to our own contexts. Many of you have attended past forums. Upon reflection, I think of a special moment in 2019 in Cambodia when on the stage I looked up and there stood the largest school meal program in the world, India, right next to the smallest school meal program in the world, Palau. Palau and India on that stage found opportunity and alignment to, change, to exchange information and to learn from each other. That's what can happen at a global event. Many of you attended the forum in 2022, co-hosted by the Republic of Benin. It has been impressive to see the acceleration of their national integrated program since the forum. In 2024, the content is gonna be focused on helping governments implement the commitments that they have made here today and previously. I don't think of the commitments as uh, commitments to the School Meals Coalition. The commitments that you have made are commitments to your own children, the children that we saw in the video. We're here to help you achieve those commitments and help the forum can help you achieve your goals. It'll be a learning exchange where governments share operational strengths with each other, with other governments who can consider how to apply it in their own countries. As the event that we're here at today is focused on ministerial level commitments, the forum might be thought of as a practitioners conference. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can learn from each other on how to do this. The content will also be fed by the results of the global survey of school meal programs, which collects the world's monitoring data on school meal programs directly from you, governments. 155 countries have participated thus far. And in the third round of the survey, which begins collecting data in November, we're going to illuminate more information about things that have been discussed here, menu changes, procurement changes, changes in energy use, 
How have nutrition in food baskets changed and how are programs managing resilience in emergencies? Every country will be invited to participate and every country will be invited to the forum. Stay tuned to hear about GCNF and about participation in the survey and for the announcement of the location of the, of the forum in late 2024. Please visit our website at gcnf.org where you will find country profiles based on results of past surveys and where you'll find future announcements for the Global Child Nutrition Forum. Thank you. Perfect. Um, thanks, Heidi. So uh, we're meeting late 2023. Uh, so if you're booking your calendars for something next year, late 2024 for the, uh, for the forum looks like a, a good shot. So a lot of the things that we've talked about uh, in, in this panel in respect of nutrition um, and nutrition in general is obviously focused on a really vital, important window, namely the first thousand days. Um, and uh, our next speaker comes from uh, an organisation that's committed to supporting countries uh, implement programs that support improved tr nutrition in those days. But he's going to talk to us a little bit about the fact that uh, that and school feeding, which opens up a new window and looks at the critical development uh, that can be supported through school feeding and school meals uh, over the next 7,000 days, uh, are not mutually exclusive. They're very supportive of each other and are linked. So, Professor, uh, over to you on that very issue. Thank you so much to give me the floor, but we are in France, so you can understand that I am going to switch in France, in French. Um, D'abord, je voudrais vous dire combien je suis très heureux de participer au premier sommet mondial pour l'alimentation scolaire. Uh, Cette idée, cette initiative venue de la Finlande, de la France, est un secrétariat général qui est le programme alimentaire mondial que je, je tiens à saluer aujourd'hui. Euh, je voudrais remercier également le président Macron pour cette initiative. Vous savez, ce qui nous réunit aujourd'hui nécessite une action collective, urgente et massive, parce que les objectifs sont énormes. Il y a deux sortes d'objectifs, ceux que l'on connaît, dont on parle toujours et qu'on en parle depuis hier matin, par exemple 800 millions de personnes en sous-nutrition, 2 milliards 400 millions de personnes qui n'ont pas accès chaque jour à une alimentation nutritive, sûre, suffisante, essentiellement des femmes, des enfants, essentiellement dans les zones rurales et le changement climatique ne peut que aggraver cela. Et puis, il y a une chose dont on parle presque jamais, pas vous, bien sûr, parce que vous le savez, mais la plupart des gens, l'opinion publique, les chefs d'État, ne savent pas une réalité. Elle s'appelle la malnutrition chronique. C'est la maladie la plus fréquente pour les enfants. C'est plus d'un enfant de moins de 5 ans sur 5 C'est 22% des enfants dans le monde. Qu'est-ce qu'une malnutrition chronique C'est une urgence de santé publique, c'est une vraie menace existentielle de l'humanité. C'est la seule maladie que je connaisse qui est une maladie de la pauvreté et qui engendre la pauvreté. Maladie de la pauvreté parce que les femmes enceintes très pauvres, celles qui gagnent moins de 2 dollars par jour, ne peuvent pas acheter de poisson et de viande. Pas de protéines, pas de vitamines, pas de nutriments. Et c'est une, une maladie qui entraîne la pauvreté parce que quand vous ne mangez pas tout cela lorsqu'une femme est enceinte, vous avez un problème dans le développement du corps et du cerveau. Et donc les conséquences sont très connues. Premièrement, un déficit immunitaire, et ça, on n'avait pas très bien compris ce que c'était. Ça veut dire que la dans les pays où il y a de la malnutrition chronique, la moitié des malades, la morbidité, la moitié des morts, la mortalité, est due à la malnutrition chronique. Deuxièmement, une taille un peu petite. Et troisièmement, surtout, une diminution considérable du potentiel intellectuel et donc du capital humain dont on parlait tout à l'heure. 
Pourquoi Parce que vous, comme moi, nous avons eu jusqu'à nos trois ans un million de connexions neuronales entre les cellules nerveuses, un million par seconde. Et s'il vous manque de la vitamine, en particulier vitamine A, s'il vous manque des, des, des protéines, s'il vous manque de l'iode, du fer, des folates, alors vous n'avez pas ces connexions. Et donc le risque, c'est de diminuer le, le, le quotient intellectuel de 9, voire de 30%. Donc c'est des conditions terribles. Qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire C'est agir immédiatement, c'est-à-dire dès la grossesse, bien sûr, sur le plan de l'investissement, il faut savoir que c'est le meilleur investissement au monde. Un dollar dans la malnutrition chronique, 16 dollars en rendement. Toutes les études montrent que si en Afrique et en Asie, on diminuait de moitié la malnutrition chronique, on augmenterait la, croissance, la, la productivité mondiale de 11%. Est-ce que vous vous rendez compte de ce que ça représente en termes de croissance et en termes de PIB par habitant Donc voilà, je voudrais juste vous dire que nous avons créé pour cela aux Nations Unies, dans une agence qui s'appelle le UNCDF, et c'est l'occasion pour moi de, de, de saluer Xavier Michon, qui est le numéro 2 de UNCDF et qui nous a permis de faire ça. Nous sommes donc à New York, le secrétariat est à Paris, le conseil d'administration, c'est la France, les Émirats Arabes Unis, le programme alimentaire mondial, euh, Ecobank, etc. Et ce que nous avons déjà commencé à faire, c'est bien évidemment des programmes pour permettre à des petites entreprises de donner plus de protéines, plus de vitamines dans des euh, produits alimentaires pour que les femmes enceintes, les femmes allaitantes, les nouveau nés les nourrissons puissent en prendre, et bien sûr en préscolaire et en en scolaire. Donc il y a un continuum entre le début de la grossesse et la période scolaire. C'est ça qui est important dans, dans l'enfant. Je voudrais remercier Hubert Chauvet qui est ici, qui est le directeur exécutif du Nitlife. Voilà, je termine en disant que la vision, et au fond je salue Madame Kahn du Sun, euh, la vision que nous devons avoir, c'est la suivante. Autonomisation des femmes, ça c'est la première chose. Développement d'une agriculture qui doit être une agriculture inti, euh, euh, je dirais intelligente sur le plan de la nutrition, sensible à la nutrition, développement de marchés pérennes, et enfin développement des protections sociales. Et je sais que le programme alimentaire mondial est très important sur la protection sociale, et évidemment se battre pour le droit fondamental de l'accès à la nourriture pour tous. Brilliant, because uh, although in a way uh, the work that the professor talked about and the School Meals Coalition, they're coming at the, the same challenge from slightly different vantage points, but let me say I can I completely agree that um, we, we have a common cause in empowering women, in transforming hu uh, food systems, uh, and, in, and then in thirdly, extending social protection. And what's the single biggest social protection mechanism in the world? school feeding. So we want to scale that up and improve it. At the same time, as we've heard already over the last couple of days, the same two points that the professor made, we want to empower women in that process, supporting them and transform food systems in the process. So a common cause, tackling uh, a shared issue, but from slightly di two different vantage points. Colleagues, this panel, has done very well in not only keeping to time, but um, beating the time, because I've got the clock right in the front of me. Um, it's ticking away, but we're actually going to finish earlier than we might have uh, been expected to do so. That shows the efficiency of politicians. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I suspect that might be the exception to the rule, but I will take it, we'll take it. Um, so, so colleagues, thank you all for being with us.
Please uh, join me in thanking the panel, but let me just remind you uh, what we covered and the fact that as we grow this coalition of the willing, as we grow this movement for school feeding, today we saw an uh, announcement made by colleagues from civil society, colleagues from uh, uh, parliaments around the world, uh, as well as two institutions that are already doing this work, but that are committed to doing more of it. Um, that's what this last two days has been about, growing the movement for this fantastic cause. And we wanna thank you for being part of that, but I also want to take the opportunity to thank our panel for voicing all of that commitment, all of that energy, and in a way, giving us even that little bit more hope that I referred to at the start of this session, hope that things can change, hope that things can be better, and hope that we can solve some of those big challenges, which we all come with a heavy heart to this meeting, acknowledging, but at the same time, knowing that transformation is possible. Thank you for being part of this journey with us. Thank you so much. We gave you a very challenging task, which was to hold this audience spellbound after they had missed their snack and then waiting for lunch and you succeeded as we'll say in French, avec brio. You did so well, you merit another round of applause to all of you. And anyone who missed this session, you missed the energy. The civil society came with the voice. We heard from parliamentarians, not only the ones who are in with the government, uh, in the party that is in power, but the opposition, the minority, and they talked about holding the government to account. We heard those parliamentarians who work with the government as well talk about what they could do better. And what was impressive, I must say, was seeing the ministers sitting in front, nodding and accepting that this is what we need. And then these agencies that are working and thinking of, the, uh, of planning, of taking this forward, I must admit that I have been inspired. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And at this point, I will not keep you here any further. I will just want to indicate that lunch today is just for 60 minutes. And this we are doing for your own pleasure. I, 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 and the whole idea is we want that by 3.30, we have said it all 